Chapter 66 The Name of All Names Afraid but determined, Aragon strode forward with Arya, Elva, and Saphira toward the dice where Galbatorix sat relaxed upon his throne. It was a long walk, long enough that Aragon had time to consider a number of strategies, most of which he discarded as impractical. He knew that strength alone would not be enough to defeat the king. It would require cunning as well, and that was the one thing he felt he most lacked. Still, they had no choice now but to confront Galbatorix. The two rows of lanterns that led to the dice were wide enough apart that the four of them were able to walk side by side. For that, Aragon was glad, as it meant Sephira would be able to fight next to them if need be. As they approached the throne, Aragon continued to study the chamber around them. It was, he thought, a strange room for a king to receive guests in. Aside from the bright path that lay before them, most of the space was hidden within impenetrable gloom, even more so than the halls of the dwarves between Trondheim and Farthendur, and the air contained a dry, musky scent that seemed familiar, even though he could not place it. "'Where is Shukin?' he asked in an undertone. Saphir sniffed. "'I can smell him, but I don't hear him.' Elva frowned. "'Nor can I feel him.' When they were perhaps thirty feet from the dice, they halted. Behind the throne hung thick black curtains made of velvety material, which stretched up toward the ceiling. A shadow lay over Galbatorix, concealing his features. Then he leaned forward, into the light, and Aragon saw his face. It was long and lean, with a deep brow and a blade-like nose. His eyes were hard as stones, and they showed a little white around the irises. His mouth was thin and wide with a slight downturn at the corners, and he had a close-cropped beard and mustache, which, like his clothes, were black as pitch. In age, he appeared to be in his fourth decade, still at the height of his strength, yet near the beginning of his decline. There were lines on his brow and on either side of his nose, and his tanned skin had a thin look to it, as if he had eaten nothing but rabbit meat and turnips through the winter. His shoulders were broad and well-built, and his waist trim. Upon his head was a crown of reddish gold set with all manner of jewels. The crown appeared old, older even than the hall, and Aragon wondered if perhaps it had once belonged to King Palancar many hundreds of years ago. On Galbatorix's lap rested his sword. It was a rider's sword, that much was obvious, but Aragon had never seen its like before. The blade, hilt, and crossguard were stark white, while the gem within the pommel was as clear as a mountain spring. Altogether, there was something about the weapon that Aragon felt unsettling. Its color, or rather its lack of color, reminded him of a sun-bleached bone. It was the color of death, not life, and it seemed far more dangerous than any shade of black, be it ever so dark. Galbatorix examined each of them in turn, with his sharp, unblinking gaze. "'So, you have come to kill me,' he said. "'Well, then, shall we begin?' He lifted his sword and spread his arms to either side in a welcoming gesture. Aragon widened his stance and raised his sword and shield. The king's invitation unsettled him. "'He's playing with us.' Still keeping hold of the Dalf dart, Elva stepped forward and began to speak. However, no sound came from her mouth, and she looked at Aragon with an expression of alarm. Aragon tried to touch her mind with his own, but he could feel nothing of her thoughts. It was as if she were no longer in the room with them. Galbatorix laughed, then returned his sword to his lap and leaned back in his throne. "'Did you truly believe that I was ignorant of your ability, child? Did you really think that you could render me helpless with such a petty, transparent trick?' Oh, I have no doubt your words could harm me, but only if I can hear them. His bloodless lips curved in a cruel, humorless smile. Such folly. This is the extent of your plan. A girl who cannot speak unless I grant her leave. A spear more suited for hanging on a wall than carrying into battle. And a collection of Eldunari half out of their minds with age. Tut, tut. I had thought better of you, Arya. And you, Glader, but then I suppose your emotions have clouded your reason since I used Murtag to slay Aromas. To Aragon, Sephira, and Arya, Glader said, Kill him. The golden dragon felt perfectly calm, but his very serenity betrayed an anger that surpassed all other emotions. 
Aragon exchanged a quick glance with Arya and Saphira, and then the three of them started toward the dice, even as Glader, Umaroth, and the other Eldunari attacked Galvatorix's mind. Before Aragon managed to take more than a few steps, the king rose up from his velvet seat and shouted a word. The word reverberated within Aragon's mind, and every part of his being seemed to thrum in response, as if he were an instrument upon which a bard had struck a chord. Despite the intensity of his response, Aragon was unable to remember the word. It faded from his mind, leaving behind only the knowledge of his existence and how it had affected him. Galbatorix uttered other words after the first, but none seemed to have the same power, and Aragon was too dazed to comprehend their meaning. As the last phrase left the king's lips, a force gripped Aragon, stopping him in mid-stride. The jolt shook a yelp of surprise from him. He tried to move, but his body might as well have been encased in stone. All he could do was breathe, look, and, as he had already discovered, speak. He did not understand. His wards should have protected him from the king's magic. That they did not left him feeling as if he were teetering on the edge of a vast abyss. Next to him, Arya, Saphira, and Elva appeared likewise immobilized. Enraged by how easily the king had caught them, Aragon joined his mind with the Eldunari as they battered at Galbatorix's consciousness. He felt a vast number of minds opposing them, dragons all, who crooned and babbled and shrieked in a mad, disjointed chorus that contained such pain and sorrow. Aragon wanted to pull himself away, lest they drag him down to, into their insanity. They were strong, too, as if most of them had been Glader's size or larger. The opposing dragons made it impossible to attack Galbatorix directly. Every time Aragon thought he felt the touch of the king's thoughts, one of the enslaved dragons would throw itself at Aragon's mind and, gibbering all the while, force him to retreat. Fighting the dragons was difficult on account of their wild and incoherent thoughts. Subduing any one of them was like trying to hold down a rabid wolf. And there were so many of them, far more than the riders had hidden in the Vault of Souls. Before either side could gain the advantage, Galbatorix, who seemed entirely unaffected by the invisible struggle, said, "'Come out, my dears, and meet our guests.' A boy and a girl emerged from behind the throne and came to stand by the king's right hand. The girl looked about six, the boy perhaps eight or nine. They shared a close resemblance, and Aragon guessed they were brother and sister. Both were dressed in their night garments. The girl clung to the boy's arm and half hid behind him, while the boy appeared frightened but determined. Even as he struggled against Galbatorix's Eldenari, Aragon could feel the minds of the children, could feel their terror and confusion, and he knew they were real. "'Isn't she charming?' asked Galbatorix, lifting the girl's chin with one long finger. "'Such large eyes and such pretty hair. And isn't he a handsome young lad?' He put his hand on the boy's shoulder. "'Children, it is said, are a blessing to us all. I do not happen to share that belief. It has been my experience that children are every bit as cruel and vindictive as adults. They only lack the strength to subjugate others to their will. Perhaps you agree with me, perhaps you don't. Regardless, I know that you of the Varden pride yourselves on your virtue. You see yourselves as upholders of justice, defenders of the innocent, as if any are truly innocent, and as noble warriors fighting to right an ancient wrong. Very well, then, let us test your convictions and see if you are what you claim to be. Unless you stop your attack, I shall kill these two. He shook the boy's shoulder. And I shall kill them if you dare attack me again. In fact, if you displease me excessively, I shall kill them anyway, so I advise you to be courteous. The boy and the girl appeared sick at his words, but they made no attempt to flee. Aragon looked over at Arya, and he saw his despair mirrored in her eyes. Umaroth! They cried out. No! Growled the white dragon, even as he wrestled with the mind of another Eldenari. You have to stop! Said Arya. No! He'll kill them! Said Aragon. No! We will not give up! Not now! Enough! Roared Glader. There are hatchlings in danger! And more hatchlings will be in danger if we do not kill the eggbreaker. Yes, but now is the wrong time to try, said Arya. Wait a little while, 
then perhaps we can find a way to attack him without risking the lives of the children. And if not? asked Umaroth. Neither Aragon nor Arya could bring themselves to answer. Then we will do what we must, said Zephyra. Aragon hated it, but he knew she was right. They could not place the two children before the whole of Alangasia. If possible, they would save the boy and the girl. But if not, then they would still attack. They had no other choice. As Umaroth and the Eldunari he spoke for grudgingly subsided, Galvatorx smiled. There, that's better. Now we may speak as civilized beings, without worrying about who was trying to kill whom. He patted the boy on the head, then pointed toward the steps of the dice. Sit. Without arguing, the two children settled on the lowest step, as far from the king as they could get. Then Galvatorx motioned and said, Quasta! And Aragon slid forward until he was standing at the base of the dice, as did Arya, Elva, and Sephira. Aragon continued to be bewildered that their wards were not protecting them. He thought of the word, whatever it might have been, and a horrible suspicion began to take root within him. Hopelessness quickly followed. For all their plans, for all their talking and worrying and suffering, for all their sacrifices, Galvatorx had captured them as easily as he might a litter of newborn kittens. And if Aragon's suspicion was true, the king was even more formidable than they had suspected. Still, they were not entirely helpless. Their minds were, for the moment, their own. And so far as he could tell, they could still use magic, one way or another. Galvatorx's gaze settled upon Aragon. So, you are the one who has given me so much trouble, Aragon, son of Morzan. You and I should have met long ago. Had your mother not been so foolish as to hide you in Carvajal, you would have grown up here in Urubain, as a child of the nobility, with all the riches and responsibilities that entails, instead of whiling away your days grubbing in the dirt. Be as that may, you are here now and those things shall at last be yours. They are your birthright, your inheritance, and I shall see to it that you receive them. He seemed to study Aragon with greater intensity, and then he said, You look more like your mother than your father. With Murtag, the opposite holds true. Still, it matters little. Whichever one you resemble most, it is only right that you and your brother should serve me, even as did your parents. Never, said Aragon with a clenched jaw. A thin smile appeared on the king's face. Never, we shall see. His gaze shifted. And you, Sephira, of all my guests today, I am gladdest to see you. You have grown to a fine adulthood. Do you remember this place? Do you remember the sound of my voice? I spent many a night talking to you and the other eggs in my charge, during the years when I was securing my rule over the Empire. I, I remember a little, said Sephira, and Aragon relayed her words to the king. She did not want to communicate directly with the king, nor would the king have allowed it. Keeping their minds separate was the best way to protect themselves when not in open conflict. Galvatorx nodded. And I am sure you will remember more the longer you stay within these walls. You may not have been fully aware of it at the time, but you spent most of your life in a room not far from here. This is your home, Sephira. It is where you belong, and it is where you will build your nest and lay your eggs. Sephira's eyes narrowed, and Aragon felt a strange yearning from her, mixed with a burning hatred. The king moved on. Are you drowning you? Fate, it seems, has a sense of humor, for here you are even as I ordered you to be brought so long ago. Your path was a roundabout one, but still you have come, and of your own accord. I find that rather amusing, don't you? Arya pressed her lips together and refused to answer. Gabatorx chuckled. I admit you have been a thorn in my side for quite some time now. You've not caused as much mischief as that bumbling meddler Brom, but neither have you been idle. One might even say that this whole situation is your fault, as it was you who sent Saphir's egg to Aragon. However, I hold no enmity toward you. If not for you, 
Sephira might not have hatched, and I might have never been able to flush the last of my enemies from hiding. For that, I thank you. And then there is you, Elva, the girl with the sigil of a rider upon her brow, dragon-marked and blessed with the wherewithal to perceive all that pains a person and all that will pain them. How you must have suffered these past months! How you must despise those around you for their weaknesses, even as you are forced to share in their misery. The Varden have used you poorly. Today I shall end the battles that have so tormented you, and you shall no longer have to endure the mistakes and misfortunes of others. That I promise. On occasion, I may have need of your skill, but in the main, you may live as you please, and peace shall be yours. Elva frowned, but it was obvious that the king's offer tempted her. Listening to Galvatorix, Aragon realized, could be as dangerous as listening to Elva herself. Galvatorix paused and fingered the wire-wrapped hilt of his sword while he regarded them with a hooded gaze. Then he looked past them toward the point in the air where the Eldunari floated hidden from sight, and his mood seemed to darken. "'Convey my words to Umarath as I speak them,' he said. "'Umarath, we are ill met once again. I thought I killed you on Rowan Guard.' Umarath responded, and Aragon began to relay his words. "'He says—' "'That you killed only his body,' Arya finished. "'That much is obvious,' said Galvatorix. "'Where did the riders hide you and those with you? "'On Rowan Guard, or was it elsewhere? "'My servants and I searched the ruins of Doru Arabea most closely.' "'Aragon hesitated to deliver the dragon's answer, "'as it was sure to displease the king, "'but he could think of no other option. "'He says that he will never share that information with you of his own free will.' "'Gavatorix's eyebrows met above his nose. "'Does he now?' Well, he'll tell me soon enough, whether he wishes to or not. The king tapped the pommel of his glaringly white sword. I took this blade from his rider, you know, when I killed him, when I killed Vrail, and the watchtower that overlooks Palancar Valley. Vrail had his own name for this sword. He called it Islinger, Lightbringer. I thought Ronger was more appropriate. Ronger meant awry and Aragon agreed that it fitted the sword better. A dull boom sounded behind them, and Galbatorix smiled again. Ah, good. Murtag and Thorn shall be joining us shortly, and then we can begin properly. Another sound filled the chamber, and then a great gusting noise that seemed to come from several directions at once. Galbatorix glanced over his shoulder and said, It was inconsiderate of you to attack so early in the morning. I was already awake. I raised well before dawn, but you woke Shrukin. He gets rather irritated when he is tired, and when he's irritated, he tends to eat people. My guards learned long ago not to disturb him when he's resting. You would have done well to follow their example. As Galvatorx spoke, the curtains behind his throne shifted and rose toward the ceiling. With a sense of shock, Aragon realized that they were actually Shrukin's wings. The black dragon lay curled on the floor with his head close to the throne, the bulk of his massive body forming a wall too steep and too high for any to climb without magic. His scales had not the radiance of saphirs or thorns, but rather sparkled with a dark, liquid brilliance. Their inky color made them almost opaque, which gave them an appearance of strength and solidity that Aragon had not seen in a dragon's scales before. It was as if Srukin were plated with stone or metal, not gems. The dragon was enormous. Aragon at first had difficulty comprehending that the entire shape before them was a single living creature. He saw part of Shrukin's corded neck and thought he was seeing the main part of the dragon's body. He saw the side of one of Shrukin's hind feet and mistook it for a shin. A fold of a wing was an entire wing in his mind. Only when he looked up and found the spikes atop the dragon's spine did Aragon grasp the full extent of Shrukin's size. Each spike was as wide as the trunk of an ancient oak tree. The scales surrounding them were a foot thick, if not more. Then Shrukin opened an eye and looked down at them. His iris was a pale blue white, the color of a high mountain glacier, and it appeared startlingly bright amid the black of his scales. 
The dragon's huge, slitted orb darted back and forth as he studied their faces. His gaze seemed to contain nothing but fury and madness, and Aragon felt certain that Shrukin would kill them in an instant if Galbatorix allowed it. The stare of the enormous eye, especially when it held such evident malice, made Aragon want to run and hide in a burrow deep, deep underground. It was, he imagined, very much how a rabbit must feel when confronted by a large, toothy creature. Beside him, Saphira growled, and the scales along her back rippled and lifted like hackles. In response, jets of fire appeared in the yawning pits of Shrukin's nostrils, and then he growled as well, drowning out Saphira and filling the chamber with a rumble like that of a rock slide. On the dice, the two children squeaked and curled into balls, tucking their heads between their knees. Peace, Shrukin, said Galvatorix, and the black dragon grew silent again. His eyelid descended, but it did not close completely. The dragon continued to watch them through a gap a few inches wide, as if waiting for the right moment to pounce. He does not like you, said Galbatorix. But then, he does not like anyone. Do you now, Shrukin? The dragon snorted, and the smell of smoke tinged the air. Hopelessness again overwhelmed Aragon. Shrukin could kill Saphira with a bat of his paw. And as large as the chamber was, it was still too small for Saphira to evade the great black dragon for long. His hopelessness turned to frustrated rage, and he wrenched at his invisible bonds. How is it you can do this? he shouted, straining every muscle in his body. I would like to know that as well, said Arya. Galatorix's eyes seemed to gleam beneath the dark eaves of his brow. Can you not guess, Elfling? I would prefer an answer to a guess she replied. Very well. But first, you must do something so that you may know that what I say is indeed the truth. You must try to cast a spell, both of you, and then I shall tell you. When neither Aragon nor Arya made to speak, the king gestured with his hand. Go on now. I promise that I will not punish you for it. Now try. I insist. Arya went first. Thratha! she said, her voice hard and low. She was, Aragon guessed, trying to send the Dalf dart flying toward Galbatorix. The weapon, however, remained fixed to her hand. Then Aragon spoke, Brzinger! He thought that perhaps his bond with his sword would allow him to use magic where Arya could not, but to his disappointment, the blade remained as it was, glittering dimly in the dull light of the lanterns. Galbatorix's gaze grew more intense. The answer must be obvious to you now, Elfling. It has taken me most of the past century, but at long last I have found what I was searching for, a means of governing the spellcasters of Alagasia. The search was not easy. Most men would have given up in frustration, or, if they had the required patience, fear. But not I. I persisted. And through my study... I discovered what I had for so long desired, a tablet written in another land and another age, by hands that were neither elf nor dwarf nor human nor ergol, and upon that tablet there was scribed a certain word, a name that magicians throughout the ages have hunted for with nothing but di bitter disappointment as their reward. Capitorix lifted a finger. The name of all names, the name of the ancient language. Aragon bit back a curse. He had been right. That's what the Razak was trying to tell me, he thought, remembering what one of the insect-like monsters had said to him in Hellgrind. He has almost found the name, the true name. As disheartening as Galbatorix's revelation was, Aragon clung to the knowledge that the name could not stop him or Arya, or Saphira for that matter, from using magic without the ancient language. Not that it would do much good. The king's wards were sure to protect him and Shrukin from any spells they might cast. Still, if the king did not know that it was possible to use magic without the ancient language, or even if he did, but he believed that they did not, then they might be able to surprise him and maybe distract him for a moment, although Aragon was not sure how that might help. Kavatorix continued, With this word, I can reshape spells as easily as another magician might command the elements. All spells shall be subject to me, 
but I am subject to none, except for those of my choosing. Perhaps he doesn't know, Aragon thought, a spark of determination kindling in his heart. I shall use the name of names to bring every magician in Allegasia to heal, and no one shall cast a spell but with my blessing, not even the elves. At this very moment, the magicians of your army are discovering the truth of this. Once they venture a certain distance into Urubane, past the front gate, their spells cease to work as they should. Some of their enchantments fail outright, while others twist and end up affecting your troops instead of mine. Kalbatorix tilted his head, and his gaze grew distant, as if he were listening to someone whispering in his ear. It has caused much confusion among their ranks. Aragon fought an urge to spit at the king. It doesn't matter, he growled. We'll still find a way to stop you. Galbatorix seemed grimly amused. Is that so? How? And why? Think what you are saying. You would stop the first opportunity that Allegasia has had for true peace in order to sate your overdeveloped sense of vengeance. You would allow magicians everywhere to continue to have their way, regardless of the harm they cause others. That seems far worse than anything I have done. But this is idle speculation. The finest warriors of the rioters could not defeat me, and you are far from their equal. You never had any hope of overthrowing me. None of you did. I killed Durza, and I killed the Razak, said Aragon. Why not you? I am not as weak as those who serve me. You could not even trounce Murtag, and he is but a shadow of a shadow. Your father, Morzan, was far more powerful than either of you, and even he could not withstand my might. Besides, said Galbatorix as a cruel expression settled on his face, you are mistaken if you think you destroyed the Razak. The eggs and Rasleona weren't the only ones I took from the leather blocka. I have others, hidden elsewhere. Soon they shall hatch, and soon the Razak shall once more roam the earth to do my bidding. As for Durza, shades are easy to make, and they are often more trouble than they are worth. So, you see, you have won nothing, boy, nothing but false victories. Above all, Aragon hated Galbatorix's smugness and his air of overwhelming superiority. He wanted to rage at the king and curse him with every oath he knew, but for the sake of the children's safety, he held his tongue. Do you have any ideas? He asked Sephira, Arya, and Glader. No, said Sephira. The others remained silent. Umaroth, only that we should attack while we still can. A minute passed, wherein no one spoke. Galbatorix leaned on one elbow and rested his chin on his fist while he continued to watch them. By his feet... The boy and the girl cried softly. Above, Shrukin's eye remained fixed on Aragon and those with him, like a great ice-blue lantern. Then they heard the doors to the chamber open and close, and the sound of approaching footsteps, the footsteps of both a man and a dragon. Murtag and Thorn soon appeared in their field of vision. They stopped next to Sephira, and Murtag bowed. Sir! The king motioned and Murtag and Thorn walked over to the right of the throne. As Murtag took up his position, he gave Aragon a look of disgust. Then he clasped his hands behind his back and stared toward the far end of the chamber, ignoring him. "'You took longer than I expected,' said Galbatorix in a deceptively mild voice. Without looking, Murtag said, "'The gate was more damaged than I originally thought, sir, and the spells you placed on it made it difficult to repair.' Do you mean that it's my fault you are tardy? Murtag's jaw tightened. No, sir. I only mean to explain. Also, part of the hallway was rather... messy, and that slowed us. I see. We shall speak of this later, but for now, there are other matters we must attend to. For one, it is time our guests meet the final member of our party. Moreover... It is high time we had some proper light in here. And Galbatorx struck the flat of his blade against one arm of his throne, and in a deep voice he cried, Nina! At his command, 
Hundreds of lanterns sprang to life along the walls of the chamber, bathing it with warm, candle-like illumination. The room was still dim about the corners, but for the first time Aragon could make out the details of their surroundings. Scores of pillars and doorways lined the walls, and all about were sculptures and paintings and gilt scroll work. Gold and silver had been used with abundance, and Aragon glimpsed the sparkle of many jewels. It was a staggering display of wealth, even when compared with the riches of Trondheim or Elzmira. After a moment, he noticed something else. A block of gray stone, granite perhaps, eight feet tall, which stood off to the right, beyond where the light had previously reached. And chained standing to the block was Nasweda, wearing a simple white tunic. She was watching them with wide open eyes, though she could not speak, for a knotted cloth was tied over her mouth. She looked worn and tired, but otherwise healthy. Relief shot through Aragon. He had not dared to hope to find her alive. Nasweda! he shouted. Are you all right? She nodded. Has he forced you to swear fealty to him? She shook her head. Do you think I would let her tell you if I had? Asked Gabatorix. As Aragon looked back at the king, he saw Murtag cast a quick, concerned glance toward Nasweda, and he wondered at its significance. Well, have you? Aragon asked in a challenging tone. As it so happens, no. I decided to wait until I had gathered all of you together. Now that I have, none shall leave until you have pledged yourself in service to me. Nor shall you leave until I have learned the true name of each and every one of you. That is why you are here. Not to kill me, but to bow down before me and to finally put an end to this noisome rebellion. Saphira growled again, and Aragon said, We won't give in. Even to his own ears, his words seemed weak and toothless. Then they will die, said Galbatorix replied, pointing at the two children. And in the end, your defiance will change nothing. You do not seem to understand. You have already lost. Outside, the battle fares badly for your friends. Soon my men will force them to surrender, and this war will arrive at its destined conclusion. Fight if you wish. Deny what is before you if it comforts you, but nothing you do can change your fate or that of Alagasia. Aragon refused to believe that he and Saphira would have to spend the rest of their lives answering to Galbatorix. Saphira felt the same, and her anger joined with his, burning away every last bit of his fear and caution, and he said, We will kill you, I swear it. For a moment, Galbatorix appeared aggravated. Then he spoke the word again, as well as other words in the ancient language besides, and the vow Aragon had uttered seemed to lose all meaning. The words lay in his mind like a handful of dead leaves, devoid of any power to impel or inspire. The king's upper lip curved in a sneer. Swear all the oaths you want. They shall not bind you, not unless I allow them to. I'll still kill you, Aragon muttered. He understood that if he continued to resist, it might mean the lives of the two children. But Galbatorix had to be killed, and if the price of his death was the deaths of the boy and the girl, then that was a cost Aragon was willing to accept. He knew he would hate himself for it. He knew that he would see the faces of the children in his dreams for the rest of his life. But if he did not challenge Galbatorix, then all would be lost. Do not hesitate, said Umaroth. Now is the time to strike. Aragon raised his voice. Why won't you fight me? Are you a coward? Or are you too weak to match yourself against me? Is that why you hide behind these children like a frightened old woman? Aragon, said Arya in a warning tone. I am not the only one who brought a child here today, replied the king, the lines on his face deepening. There's a difference. Elva agreed to come, but you didn't answer the question. Why won't you fight? Is it that you've spent so long sitting on your throne and eating sweets that you've forgotten how to swing a sword? You would not want to fight me, young Ling, growled the king. Prove it, then. Release me and meet me in honest battle. Show that you are still a warrior to be reckoned with, or live with the knowledge that you are a sniveling coward who dares not face even a single opponent without the help of your Odunari. You killed Vrail himself. Why should you fear me? Why should— Enough! said Galvatorix. 
A flush had crept onto his hollow cheeks. Then, like Quicksilver, his mood changed, and he bared his teeth in a fearsome approximation of a smile. He wrapped the arm of his seat with his knuckles. I did not gain this throne by accepting every challenge put to me, nor have I held it by meeting my foes in honest battle. What you have yet to learn, youngling, is that it does not matter how you achieve victory, only that you achieve it. You're wrong. It does matter, said Aragon. I will remind you of that when you are sworn to me. However... Gabatorix tapped the pommel of his sword. Since you wish so badly to fight, I will grant your request. The flare of hope that Aragon felt vanished when Gavatorix added, But not with me, with Murtag. At those words, Murtag flashed an angry look at Aragon. The king stroked the fringe of his beard. I would like to know, once and for all, which of you is the better warrior. You will fight as you are, without magic or Eldunari, until one of you is unable to continue. You may not kill each other, that I forbid, but short of death, I will allow most anything. It will be rather entertaining, I think, to watch brother fight brother. No, said Aragon, not brothers, half-brothers. Brom was my father, not Morzan. For the first time, Galvatorx seemed surprised. Then one corner of his mouth twisted upward. Of course, I should have seen it. The truth is in your face for any who know what to look for. This duel will be all the more fitting, then. The son of Brom pitted against the son of Morzan. Fate, indeed, has a sense of humor. Murtag also reacted with surprise. He controlled his face too well for Aragon to determine whether the information pleased or upset him. But Aragon knew that it had thrown him off balance. That had been his plan. If Murtag was distracted, it would be that much easier for Aragon to defeat him. And he did intend to defeat him, regardless of the blood they shared. Lala, said Galbatorix with a slight motion of his hand. Aragon staggered as the spell holding him vanished. Then the king said, Ganja Apter, and Arya, Elva, and Saphira slid backward, leaving a wide space between them and the dice. The king muttered a few other words, and most of the lanterns of the chamber dimmed, so that the area in front of the throne was the brightest spot in the room. Come now, said Galbatorix to Murtag. Join Aragon, and let us see which of you is the more skilled. Scowling, Murtag walked to a spot several yards from where Aragon stood. He drew Zorak. The blade of the crimson sword looked as if it were already coated in blood, and then lifted his shield and settled into a crouch. After glancing at Saphira and Arya, Aragon did the same. Now fight, cried Galbatorix, and clapped his hands. Sweating, Aragon began to move toward Murtag, even as Murtag moved toward him.